All right, I want to welcome everybody uh, really quick. Uh, in about a minute, we're going to go ahead and uh, start up with our presentation and show that we can move into our panel uh, discussion for today. It's just about a little bit less than a minute. We're going to go ahead and go live. All right, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. My name is Bilal, and I will be your moderator this evening on behalf of Project Daqwa, as well as the rest of our team. So I hope this webinar reaches everybody in the best of health, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in remotely today. Um, inshallah, today we're going to be talking about managing addictions and eating disorders during Ramadan. Um, inshallah, we hope to shed light on some of these more taboo uh, topics, such as eating disorders, um, substance abuse, as well as even um, pornography addictions. So this webinar is brought to you by Project Daqwa. We are a Muslim mental health organization, and we are doing this in collaboration with the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, which is a partnership of hundreds of activists, influencers, and organizations providing social and civic justice towards an equitable and representative America. Also really quick, I do wanna give a super special shout out to a bunch of our partners who helped us work uh, on this webinar. So I'm just gonna go ahead and list them out. We have Khalil Center, Musa, Miss Chicago, ICN Family Support Services, CAMP, American Pakistan Foundation, um, AMHP, UIC MSA, Open Chicago, Mecca Center, MCC Youth, Ill, Muslim, Ill Muslims, Arab American Family Services, Heartspeak Institute, and Moss Community Nurses of Chicago Land. All right, before we get started, I want to hand it off to Chris from the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition so he can talk about some of their initiatives. Chris? I believe you might be muted. Okay, my bad. Assalamu alaikum. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can uh, We can hear you, Subhan. I don't know. For some reason, I can't hear Chris. I don't know if that's the situation. Yeah, no else, worries, but... inshallah. So I, what I can do is I can just quickly just go over the CARE Coalition. Cool. So alhamdulillah, the CARE Coalition is an initiative that the Muslim Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition has started. And alhamdulillah, what we do with this is we are able to connect those who need care with those who can give care. So we have a hotline, as you can see here. We have a Facebook group. We're doing a lot of great work. And if you are interested in either giving care or you know someone who needs care, we would urge to take note of this website, the bit.ly link over here. And of course, maybe just take a screenshot and we would love for all of you to uh, be a part of this effort. Awesome, thanks so much, Sapan, uh, as well as Chris. Uh, I apologize, you might've been having some sort of technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. that's what it was. Okay, cool, we can hear you now. Yeah, it right, works then. now, yeah. All <laughs> right, just look a little. Cool. All right, appreciate it, man. All right, so uh, once again, thank you. Um, before we get into our agenda, I do want to bring everybody's attention to a couple of resources. Um, this is a page that we're going to continue to put up uh, over the duration of the presentation. Um, so if you miss it now, you can catch it later, hopefully, inshallah. Um, and you can go ahead and take a screenshot now or even later. We're going to put it up a couple more times. 
Okay, so one of the main resources that I do want to bring everybody's attention to is Project Duckwa's virtual support group sessions via Zoom, via Zoom. So these sessions will be separated for males and females, and they're going to be led by mental health professionals. Uh, you're going to have the opportunity to connect with a mental health professional on an intimate level, um, as well as people who share you know, similar struggles and similar stresses. Um, so you can be anonymous. You don't have to turn on your video. You don't have to have your real name um, or any of that. So if you do want to register, you can go ahead and go to projectduckwa.org slash register um, and fill out the Google form there. And then inshallah, the finalized times will be uh, released before May 10th, inshallah. So once again, that's projectduckwa.org slash register. And I feel like this could be a really good resource for some of the uh, topics that we're about to talk about uh, today. And it is available for anybody, whether you're, you know, sitting at home in Illinois or really anywhere across the country. So, okay. So tonight we're going to be covering a few different guidelines in housekeeping. And then we're going to move into the actual presentation uh, about the topic being covered, which again is uh, managing addictions and eating disorders during Ramadan. And then we're going to hop into a panel discussion with our wonderful panelists who will introduce themselves in a little bit. We're also gonna have an integrated Q&A. So if you do have a question uh, throughout the uh, panel, go ahead and leave it in the chat box or the Q&A and inshallah we can weave it into the scenario. So feel free to leave all your questions there. All right, a really quick safety reminder. I know that everyone might be a little bit sick of hearing this, but I do want to bring it to your attention. So the World Health Organization has outlined these precautions. So make sure to wash your hands often, cough into your elbow, don't touch your face and keep a safe distance from one another and stay at home as much as possible. Once again, these are guidelines, um, you know, mandated by the World Health Organization. So it's important to practice them in the time that we're living in right now in this crisis. All right, once again, the moderator myself will be leading, everybody else will be muted, just be respectful of the speaker. If you have any questions, um, feel free to leave them uh, down below on the chat box. And if you need expert assistance, you can fill out the CARE Coalition that Subhan and Chris talked about. And if you are in any sort of emergency, uh, please do dial 911. All right, just to get right into it, um, 2020 may be a little bit different for eating disorders and addiction, which is our topic for today. So while eating disorders and addictions are a severe issue basically in any time, uh, during 2020, it might be even more severe. Um, because of the coronavirus crisis, people with eating disorders and addictions may engage in more risk behaviors due to the quarantine. They also may feel a little bit anxious um, due to the crisis, and they have less access to professional help because everybody's kind of stuck in their homes. So aside from the coronavirus crisis, uh, Ramadan may also prove to be a pretty difficult time for people with eating disorders. Um, that may be because of the heightened focus on food and the short window of eating, which can cause old behaviors uh, for people with eating disorders to turn, causing a potential relapse. Um, these are some things we're going to get into, inshallah, in our panel discussion. Okay, and as far as our other topic for today, which is drug and porn addictions, Ramadan can also uh, affect those. Um, so it may affect those because people who are dealing with these things may feel an immense guilt from the actions that they partake in on a daily basis. Um, and some of these addictions may actually make it hard to even fast, because if you were to do these things while fasting, you may potentially break the fast. Um, once again, this applies to both the drug addictions as well as pornography addictions. All right, now we have a couple of numbers. So first we're gonna start with the United States. So what's the situation like in the United States? Um, unfortunately, it is pretty bad. So here you can see um, almost every hour somebody dies from an eating disorder in the United States. And tens of millions of people in, in the US also deal with pornography addiction as well as substance abuse. So uh, not good things. So while the U United States as a whole has a pretty major issue um, in these topics, you may be surprised to hear that a study done in 2014 found that Muslim college students in the US also took part in these behaviors. Uh, over 40% of male and female Muslim college students have drank alcohol and over 15% of Muslim college students have also smoked marijuana and used illicit drugs. So these stats may come off as shocking, but unfortunately it is reality, uh, whether we wanna accept it or not. Uh, it is important that we deal with things while they are happening um, instead of denying the fact that they exist. So like I just said, let's, um, these, these, uh, these issues are definitely rampant. They're very severe. So what is the truth about these things? The truth is that these things, like I said, are happening in our community, whether we want to accept them or not. 
It is important to remember though, these issues can be improved upon uh, by getting professional help. And along with this, it's important to be mindful of fact of the fact that your mental health struggle, struggles are not a reflection of your faith. So it is okay to not be okay. Um, and just because you deal with something like an eating disorder does not necessarily make you a bad Muslim or a bad person. So keep that in mind. Once again, we have our uh, slide of resources over here. Uh, so these resources um, range from counseling services to direct helplines to peer-to-peer -peer youth hotlines. So once again, uh, if you want to go ahead and take a picture or a screenshot of this, please feel free to do so. Okay, so from everybody at Project Dakwa, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, and all of our partners, we want to encourage everybody to look after their well mental uh, well-being as well as their physical well-being during this time. So stay safe, stay healthy, and most importantly, stay sane. All right, so now we're going to be uh, transitioning into our panel discussion for today. So once again, our panel is going to consist of five different scenarios um, discussing some of the topics that I had touched on earlier and insights from our panelists uh, are going to be given on each of these scenarios. Once again, if you have a question uh, that relates to the topic, please go ahead and um, you know leave it down below. All right, now we can go ahead and introduce everybody. Uh, so we can go ahead and start with uh, Iman. Go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm like, I'm everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Iman and I'm currently pursuing my master's in mental health counseling at Northwestern University. Um, as part of my program, I'm also routinely seeing a caseload of clients who deal with a lot of the topics that we're going to be covering today. I've also been involved in the Islamic community of the Western suburbs, both through attending Islamic school and also taking part in community work at the masjid. I'm also currently sitting on the next generation board of the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. I'm excited to, you know, get into these discussions, inshallah. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Shoaib, you can go ahead and go next. Sure. Uh, Assalamu My name is Shoaib Maiman. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, so I'm ha very happy to be here on this webinar with you all um, and on this panel. Um, I, uh, about myself, um, I'm a psychiatrist. I've been prior to practice in, in Duluth and also um, I teach at University of Chicago. So uh, today, you know, we're on this, uh, in this webinar today, we're talking about addictions and eating disorders. And I'm going to be talking about a lot about how I approach those in my practice. Um, so I provide group therapy, individual therapy and medication management. I consider group therapy really be the core of treatment in the sort of things that we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to refer, be referring to that a lot. Um, so I'm um, um, looking forward to getting into these scenarios with the panelists um, and your questions. Awesome, Dr. Shoaib. Uh, Sheikh Hassan, would you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all of you. Uh, my name is Hassan Ali and uh, currently I'm serving as the Imam and uh, Director of uh, the Mecca Center in Willbrook, Illinois. Uh, I'm also working on my PhD in theology uh, from Lutheran School of Theology and I'm teaching also at uh, Lewis University in the Department of Theology. I'm so happy to uh, join you uh, uh, to discuss these very important topics, especially in the month of Ramadan. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Brother Inak, would you go ahead and go next? Assalamu alaikum. My name is Brother Enoch Mohammed. I'm a co-founder of Hip Hop Detox, which is a public health organization. We are certified trauma professionals that work in the areas of physical and mental wellness, conflict resolution, cultural arts and we focus on social emotional learning with a lot of the youth that we work with in various school districts in Chicago and outside of the city of Chicago. Uh, we use hip hop and pop culture as a tool to increase resiliency, grit, critical thinking, conscious listening. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the issues that we deal with surround a variety of traumas that's considered uh, part of the adverse uh, childhood experiences uh, spectrum. So. Um, a lot of the work that we do, of course, uh, is centered on a lot of these issues, and this is um, all ethnic groups and all backgrounds. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Jazakallah here to all of our panelists. We're excited to get into the discussion. We're super blessed to have so many different perspectives uh, to talk about some of the heavy topics that we're going to get into. Uh, once again, all these scenarios are based on real things that are actually happening. So everybody just keep that in mind. If you do have a question, please go ahead and leave it down below. So let's get started to, uh, started with scenario number one. I'm just gonna go ahead and read it out. And whoever wants to respond can go ahead and do so. So 
I never thought I would drink a single sip of alcohol or take drugs, yet here I am doing both multiple times a day. Growing up Muslim, I feel like I live a double life. My parents did not know about my drinking habits and drug addiction. If they did, they would kill me. I usually dislike the person I am when I drink, and I identify less and less with Islam the more I do it. Someone like me does not even deserve to, to fast in Ramadan or pray Taraweeh. What can I do to turn things around? So I think this is a pretty loaded um, loaded scenario. So if anybody wants to go ahead and take a crack at it, uh, Iman, you can go ahead and start. Sure. So, you know, this is a very prevalent problem within our community, as we all know, where we see individuals very heavily reliant on not only alcohol, but then, as you said, drugs as well. And those drugs can include prescription pills, medicinal drugs, heroin, cocaine, you know, so many different things. But what we see a lot clinically, too, in regards to why people turn to substances like alcohol and drugs and form addictions is to cope with the pressures, expectations, negative emotions, experiences, and, you know, all these, these different things that people are facing. And even as a community, you know, as a Muslim community, we see this a lot where there are a lot of expectations and pressures placed upon individuals, which, which have such negative effects on a person's, you know, mental health, but physical health, too. And so these individuals then feel that drugs or alcohol can help them forget the worries and stressors and help them essentially have a better time or let loose or, you know, just feel better about themselves. And then, you know, furthermore to where we are currently in terms of, you know, being in quarantine and having to stay home and away from people, and especially during Ramadan as well, I think it's important to recognize that a huge trigger for any addiction is isolation. So, you know, moments of feeling alone and disconnected with others, you know, in these moments, we kind of turn to unhealthy ways to relieve stress or feel enjoyment. So I'm not saying that these are excuses, but I really want to highlight that this is a reality, especially within our Muslim community. And it's something that we all need to be more aware of so we can better kind of tackle these issues. So one advice I think I can give to a person who may be struggling with this kind of issue, especially during quarantine and during Ramadan, is to that it's very important to kind of find other ways of coping. So kind of finding your own support system or reaching out to family and friends and people in our community who can really give us that level of support and give us that level of, you know, care that so that we don't have to kind of rely on these negative substances to feel, you know, emotion and feel better is could be a good way to kind of, you know, relieve us from some of this stress. So finding ways to engage with the community and, you know, connecting with others, I think is really important. Oh, I just wanted to add on to that, um, you know, going off of the community part. Um, I mean, this is a, such a great scenario that you, that you have here. Every single sentence has something that is, you know, a huge thing to address for this person. So you have to appreciate the level of challenge that this person is going through um, in terms of, I think, really acceptance of themselves and um, uh, the way they seem to have constructed it, that they, they really dislike themselves they don't have a sense of belonging and they feel like they don't even deserve to be Muslim. So you have to be kind of saddened by, by the condition of this person. So there's a lot to be done here and a lot that can be done here. Um, so, you know, why could, why would somebody say that they don't deserve to fast or pray? If that's a universal gift for everybody, why do you feel like you're not, you're not able to do that? Um, what is the deal with, uh, you know, my parents would kill me. Like what, what does that uh, tell us about this person's experience of their family of origin? Um, and, you know, uh, the whole doing it multiple times a day, really in Ramadan, that's especially, uh, I think, interesting and challenging for this person because you can't just stop doing that. You, it could be a dangerous situation for you to abstain from alcohol. So is it really appropriate for you? Are you really in a position where you can fast? So a person like this really would want to engage a lot of supports of help. If, you know, uh, the religious practices are so important to them, they would need support from uh, somebody who they trust religiously as a religious authority to see how they can manage this in this month. Um, and also, you know, to engage in a program, um, some sort of program to help them uh, with a professional, I think, to, to see this as a long-term path and not just a thing to fix in this particular month, because that's setting yourself up for an impossible situation. So there's really so much here uh, that this person is bringing in that I think that all of it could be helped with it if, they, if they were to reach out for help. I would like also to add to uh, what Dr. Shaib just mentioned and uh, what Sister Iman said that uh, since we see here uh, many uh, sentences with regard to um, himself feeling guilty uh, or does not really deserve uh, to be Muslim or fast during the months of Ramadan or pray Taraweeh. You know, we have to remind ourselves and re remind uh, our brother or our sister 
who sinned this, that God Almighty said to his prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we have not sent you but as a mercy to the wounds. Which means that Islam is a religion of mercy. You know, in Sahih Muslim, in the sound narration, Abu Huraira reported that the messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, by him in whose hand in my soul, if you did not sin, Allah would replace you with people who would sin and they would seek forgiveness from Allah and he would forgive them. So, you know, we have to understand that Islam came to um, uh, uh, try to organize our desires, not really to ignore it. And actually, just by, by reading his, uh, uh, his message and his description of, him, of himself, just by feeling guilty or that he does not deserve to be a Muslim, that's a great sign by itself. It means that he knows that, you know, what he, what, you know the way that he's uh, doing or the way of his life is not really the best way uh, to, to live in. And this is by itself means that this person has a lot of goodness uh, in his or her heart. And um, uh, to, to be a Muslim uh, does not really mean to be an angel. We have to understand that. You know, we are human beings. And even Adam, the first uh, uh, person, I always look at Adam as the first uh, most updated version of humanity. And he received only one order from Allah and he forgot, he, he disobeyed Allah. And this is not by chance. This is actually to teach us that as human beings, we are going to forget and we are going to be weak and we are going, and that's why God Almighty made the, uh, the gate of repentance. I will just mention very quick uh, story, uh, maybe similar to what we have uh, in, our, in, our, in our societies and our communities with regard to uh, those who do not really think that they deserve to be Muslims or maybe others when they look at them they start to judge them as you know how they claim that they're Muslims or how they uh, pray uh, or fast while they are drinking or while they are uh, sinning uh, you know and also in the sound narration in Sahih al-Bukhari uh, Umar ibn Khattab reported that in the time of the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him there was a man uh, named Abdullah and Abdullah had another nickname, which is uh, Himar or Donkey. And in, in their culture at that time, it was okay to get this nickname because he was like a you know, very hard uh, um, uh, working person. And this person used to love uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, a lot. He used to go to the marketplace and if, every time he sees something good and nice, food or, or drink or a piece of cloth or whatever, he would you know, bring it to Rasulullah. Actually, one time he brought uh, some food to the Prophet and then he said, this is gift, Ya Rasulullah, this is my gift to you. And the Prophet said, okay, thank you. Then the uh, Abdullah or Himar said, okay, Rasulullah, this is the, uh, the owner of the, uh, of, of the food, so please pay him the money. And then Rasulullah started to laugh and he said, how you bring me a gift and you ask me to pay the money? He said, I, I, I love it and I, I, I thought about you, and, but I don't have money. So the, I brought the, the seller and the food uh, to you. When this guy, this person, this Sahabi, uh, he used to drink. Okay, so, uh, you know, every time they bring him um, uh, drunk and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would, uh, of course, uh, order the Sahaba to maybe uh, put him in prison or to punish him for drinking and uh, being in the, uh, in the public. And then um, one time while people were uh, witnessing this, that he was taken to the prison or the punishment, one of the Sahaba, um, uh, he said, oh Allah, curse him. How many times has he been uh, brought, you know, drunk? And this is like again and again and again. So he said, oh, Allah, curse him. Then the prophet was very upset and he said, do not curse him. By Allah, I know that he loves Allah and he loves his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So here we can see that one of the companions, he, you know, he, he, he got this, he was, this was his weak, uh, weakness, but still he can define himself as a, uh, as, as a Muslim. He can define himself as someone who, who loved Allah and who loved Rasulullah, not only by his claim, but also but, uh, by, uh, by the Prophet Wasallam's testimony as well. Yeah, thank you for that. That was beautiful. I think um, it's important to recognize that like even as people sin, um, I think lots of times people make it an excuse for themselves in their head to, you know, identify even less, you know, with Islam as opposed to kind of sectioning it off and saying, okay, I'm doing this thing, but I can still get everything else right while I'm working on this thing, while I'm asking for repentance. So I think that's very powerful. Thank you so much for that. Um, Brother Enoch, I was interested in hearing your uh, perspective on this scenario, um, as well as a, a question from one of the viewers um, that you can get into after this. And it's about quitting uh, chewing tobacco uh, and other drugs. So you can go ahead and give your thoughts on this scenario and then also that as well. Thank you. Um, the first thing I want to just put out there for us to consider 
when you read the scenario, the need for validation is very strong. And when you consider that all validation, you have to grow up and mature to understand that all validation must come from Allah because we're not perfect as it's been already stated. However, when you have uh, the pangs of shame and guilt as a young person, a college student, and you're dealing with that issue of shame and guilt because you feel like you've let your parents down, you've let your family down, you've let yourself down, you have to honestly come back full circle and say, hey, I am on the path. And my validation, my uh, approval, my recognition, I have to seek Allah for that. Because if I seek Allah for, uh, for that, then all the things that have already been mentioned from the mercy and the beneficence and all the things that we really want, we know that we still have a chance. However, you have to identify that you have a misplacement of validation. Even though you want your parents to be proud of you, you also have to recognize that all of us stand in need of mercy. So that's the first thing that I wanted to communicate uh, regarding this, because it does sound like a lot of not only college students, but high school students as well that um, have some similar issue. Um, when it comes to tobacco and the addiction, there's a lot of vaping going on. And because of the cool, you know, pose, so to speak, that's being promoted with vaping, a lot of young people don't understand that that's still tobacco. That's still tobacco. And the reality is, is that by them taking deeper pulls of the, you know, uh, of the tobacco through vaping, they're getting more and more and more of it and it's causing more and more problems. So it's a similar uh, issue in the sense of other drugs. Uh, however, from a social scientific perspective, when we look at addiction and, and, and how we define addiction, we look at addiction as the pursuit of pleasure at the expense of our freedom. And when you look at it from that perspective, it's the pursuit of pleasure. Why? Because I'm in some kind of pain. And if the pain is I need attention, I need affection, I need, I, I'm insecure, so I need security. So sometimes it's that addiction, not only to that particular um, drug, but it's also to just the human need. And so whether it's the tobacco, it's the alcohol, it's the, it's the, it's the mollies or the different type of pills that are being popped, all of this was, is in the same vein. It's just have a different you know, set of symptoms and different set of effects. Right, right. No, thank you so much for that. I think kind of just summing up this scenario, um, similar to what Sheikh Hassan uh, had talked about, as well as Brother Enoch at Shoei Iman, you know, Islam does not, you know, reject people outright who may partake in these things. Obviously, you know, they may be sinful, but, you know, it's important to uh, reach out, get help, improve on these things, and not let go of the other good things that you are doing in your life while you're, uh, while you may be taking in these risk behaviors. So thank you guys so much for that. I think with that, we can go ahead and move on to scenario two. Once again, I'm just going to read it out loud. Whoever wants to take a crack at it can go ahead and do so. Okay. All right, very similar. Smoking weed is my escape. Dealing with anxiety and depression since I was 13 is the only sense of feeling I can really get at this point. I need it to get away from all my problems. When I'm high, while it may distract me from my work and my relationships, I feel okay for a while. I know this probably isn't the most healthy way to deal with things and I want to change, but I know I'm a lost cause. I want to fast this Ramadan, but I know even if I go without food, I am not going to last without weed. So anybody who wants to, sorry, anybody who wants to go ahead and um, respond to this one can, can, uh, can proceed. I feel like it's pretty similar to our, to our first scenario and some of the discussion that we just had, um, but Dr. Shoei, if you want to if you might be muted. Okay, I'm back. Um, so I do think it's similar in terms of, uh, you know, relating it to the past scenario. Um, in terms that this person has try, is trying to manage something that is not working out by weed or alcohol, and they've traded one problem for another. Um, so they really have to pay attention. They really need help in trying to pay attention to, did you really solve your problems? And clearly they understand. There's a part of them that understand that they haven't solved their problems. And this is really part of uh, treatment of addictions is that different people are at different stages in terms of realizing that what they're doing is not working. 
So the minute that somebody actually speaks to that, they are at some point of understanding that this isn't working for me. If they've called you for help, that they're very far along um, in terms of actually realizing um, that this isn't working. Some people may still be in the stage that they're justifying their usage. This person is actually kind of farther along with that. Um, you know, this comment that I'm a lost cause, this is really a powerful statement. And I think this is where peer oriented, like group therapy, 12 step, anything like that, those sort of things are really helpful and better than one on one situations because that this person needs universality. This person needs to know that they're part of a community, even if that's a community of, uh, you know, other people who have had similar problems and people at different stages of having recovered of that problem. Uh, recovery is a lifelong issue. So if they could be around people and they could see peers that others have gotten through and there'll be like hundreds of people who have had the story that they started in teenage years. It was, they were dealing with anxiety and depression who hasn't dealt with anxiety and depression in their adolescence. Um, it's almost universal, if not universal. So I think for this person, again, um, uh, like engaging the peer uh, related support system and getting them to know that they're actually not alone and that they're actually not a good lost cause there's tons of people who have gone through this and gotten and been very successful. Uh, to give them that motivation that you're not a lost cause would be really key to help them get started. Yeah, I think I just want to kind of go off of that and reiterate some of Dr. Shoaib's points where, um, you know, from a clinical perspective, it's really important to look at why is marijuana being used as the only sense of feeling as mentioned in the scenario. So when somebody comes to a counselor with something like this, the, the main focus isn't to come up with ways to help them stop taking marijuana. I mean, at this point, as Dr. Shoaib mentioned, they know that they have to stop or they want to stop, but they've come to us because they've tried to stop and that didn't work. So our main focus is to help them find that motivation and ability to find it in, within themselves to kind of stop. So we don't focus on why they're doing it. Um, and the key statement here also is that it's the only sense of feeling I can get at this point. So I feel as though there's kind of two perspectives to look at this from. And, you know, first as a counselor, I think it's important to, you know, I would say that it's important to get a person to help them feel better about themselves. So they don't need to rely on something external to, you know, feel that way. Um, and they can kind of look to that internally to feel better about themselves. But second, even from an Islamic perspective, and I think, you know, Sheikh Hassan can speak on this as well, but I feel as though that it is really important to focus on other aspects of Islam to make the person realize that they're not a lost cause. You know, I think that it can often be really helpful to try to strengthen other aspects of our religiosity and kind of focus on other aspects of Islam, you know, to focus on praying more, reading more Quran, focusing on these different things so that we can, you know, in turn feel more confident about ourselves and feel as though we are better Muslims and then in turn, inshallah, have the strength to stop something like this or stop a negative or problematic behavior that we, that we might do. So I think it's really important to, you know, in these moments to kind of focus on these other aspects of Islam too and kind of bring those up as well. Thank you, uh, Sister Iman. I would like also to add that um, just in general, we have to, to, to look at Islam generally and how Islam has come to the benefits of the individual and the community. And so, uh, you know, uh, its laws and regulations are designed to, um, to protect these benefits and to facilitate the improvement and perfection of the life conditions of human beings. Uh, one of the five higher uh, objectives or goals of Islam is the uh, uh, preservation of the mind and, uh, and intellect. And uh, God Almighty has commanded us to preserve our minds and has forbid all the means uh, to disable it through uh, drugs or alcohol or any other uh, way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, choose us to be uh, his successors on earth. And so we need to maintain our minds, which is, is, is the basis of the uh, uh, discourse of the succession uh, on earth. Um, fasting in Ramadan, because he mentioned something or she mentioned something about fasting in Ramadan and they cannot do it and they, they feel like uh, they can give up food and drinks, but they cannot uh, give up uh, marijuana or weed. Fasting is an effective therapy for many of these common harmful habits. And, and, and it's actually a great opportunity to, um, to get uh, rid of their, their stronghold over us. It reminds us that these habits are not really necessary, necessary or unavoidable, as we, we uh, always believe. They are either self-imposed or are imposed by the circumstances of our life, and we can give them up by determination and resolution. I know many people who call me and say, you know what, even, even for, 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 for coffee, and I know that many of us might, might share, share this, uh, that I don't, I don't, I don't uh, imagine myself 
uh, fasting Ramadan without uh, uh, my morning coffee, especially at the time where, you know, outside of the COVID-19 uh, circumstances, when we go to work and we, we can smell the coffee, we can see our co-workers bringing the coffee next to us in the desk and other things. But guess what? We can do it and we do it. And even for the smokers and for those who, uh, you know, uh, eat more than three meals a day and we can do it and we, we sleep less. And it's actually all about, about our, uh, you know, what we put in our mind. And in Islam, God Almighty said that you should try, you should struggle, you should, uh, yeah, you, you, of course, you, you, we don't expect you to win at all time, but you should try again and again and again. Ask God for help and ask God for support and God Almighty will help and support those who seek his help and support. Yes, indeed. I would like to put a question out there if, if anyone is dealing with this because this is probably one of the most popular uh, scenarios. Um, so I have to ask the question, was weed in the womb with you? When you was in your mother's womb, was there some weed in there? If there was no weed in the womb with you, then you can't say you know you're not gonna last without weed. The umbilical cord had nutrition for you. You know, you had all you need through the umbilical cord, but it wasn't no, hopefully it wasn't no weed in, in the, going through the umbilical cord. <laughs> However, you don't, you know, at the end when the statement is made, I know I could go without food, but I'm not going to last without weed as if going without food is a small thing. You are exerting your will to do the will of Allah. That's a powerful thing. That's a wonderful thing. You're bending your will to that, that you were given to do the will of your creator. So you, at the end, you give in to polytheism and now weed is your God. Now you get loud as your God. Your God is loud? I don't think so. But you can allow it to be if it has that much force and power over you where you feel like you can't try something different. Nothing beats failure but a try. And if you can attempt to go without food, then you can take that same energy, that same desire and say, I am going to attempt to go without weed because food and water, much, 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 much more natural to the human being than weed. So I just want to put that out there that if if someone is watching this and they have this scenario for themselves or someone they know, ask that question. Was there some weed in the womb with you? When you were in your mother's womb, was it a lie with you or was it weed? <laughs> so, um, before we move on, I want to say a couple of that. I think um, I disagree with a couple of things that the panelists are saying as, as I understand them. Um, I think it's coming across to me that, you know, this is maybe being viewed as something that could be done, or if you really willed it strong enough, you could try it or you could do it. And I really strongly caution against that. Um, I, I appreciate the arguments that are being made at the same time. You know, I've seen people who their liver is failing and they're still drinking. I really think it's a different problem. I really think there's something very different about certain people and how they respond to alcohol, how they respond to different drugs. And you know, universally, universalizing biology, I think is, is, it can't be done. I think you know, uh, people will literally kill themselves with alcohol. Rats will, you know, rats and people, they'll press a lever until they get enough cocaine till they die. So I think I would really caution uh, if that's the idea that was being, uh, being shared, that that could be very alienating to somebody who is struggling with this. So, so I will disagree with what I understood uh, there. I may have misunderstood, but I really think to you know, liken it or equate it to abstaining from food for a limited amount of time where you know you're gonna get food later on, I don't know. Um, I, I think, I think uh, these people are going through something different. Right, I feel like, um kind of the, the next step after kind of the determination that Brother Enoch was talking about was maybe getting help as opposed to stopping cold turkey. So having the determination to say, no, I don't need this. So I'm going to take that step to, to, to go through the process of getting help. I think that might be a, a good way to look at it, kind of to combine both of you guys' perspectives. But I do appreciate you sharing the fact that, you know, there might be like a bit of a nuance to this discussion. Brother so. Bilal. Yes, sir. I, I think there's a hint in this scenario that 
if we look at it at the words here, I know this probably isn't the most healthy way. So I'm I'm in I'm acknowledging it's not the most healthy way. And then the hook, I want to change. I want to change, but I know I'm a lost cause. So you just canceled out the fact that you want to change, but you're acknowledging I want to change. So if you can show me how to change, what is the process by which I make the change? Because I, I'm saying to you, I want to change. I know that this probably is the most healthy way to deal, but I feel lost. Why? Because whatever options or alternatives that's been put in front of me, they don't seem valid to me. They don't seem real to me. Therefore, I am going to accept that I am lost. And we have to show this person the time, not in a, um, a way where we alienate them, but we do have to uh, have a dialogue with them regarding what they are willing to try. What are they willing to do? Because if we do that and have empathy for their struggle, then perhaps they'll say, well, you know what? I'll try this because I've never thought about this. Or I'll try that because I've never, I've never uh, tried that. But according to the words here, that's the reason why I would put it in that way to ask questions, to get them to answer, to get the strength from within because they want to change. They just feel lost for whatever reason they feel lost. And if they could see within and go within, then perhaps they could be part of their own solution. I, right. I think the point that we can join on is that, you know, we have to present people with a better way. The way they're doing things, the way they're doing is the way that they know. And that's why they're doing it and they consider it to be the best way. So uh, I think we can join on the point that, you know, we have to provide them with a better alternative so they could try it out and provide them with a different community um, so they could go on a path that they haven't seen before and show them that. Right, right. Uh, cool. Yeah, once again, thank you guys both for your perspective and your clarification on that. Um, definitely appreciate it. I feel like we can go ahead and jump into scenario three now. So we're going to be switching gears a little bit to more of uh, the eating disorder and a little bit of body dysmorphic disorder uh, with this one. So I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud and then inshallah, whoever wants to uh, go at it can. All right. I hate everything about the way I look. I think my nose is too big, my smile is crooked, and my body is hideous. I know I'm probably not that ugly in reality. My friends and family tell me I look just fine, but I cannot accept it. Everyone on Instagram, including all my friends, all look so good. Everyone loves them. I starve myself to look like them, and I've tried using nose clips to shrink my big, ugly nose. In Ramadan, I will probably skip iftar and suhoor on most days, even then, no matter how much weight I lose, I still feel so fat. What do I do? So for this one, I would really love to get um, Iman's perspective. And I would also, after that, love to get uh, Sayyid Hassan's perspective from like, you know, an Islamic viewpoint about eating disorders and Ramadan and that sort of thing. But we can start with Iman. Sure. So this I've seen is a huge issue amongst adolescents and young adult populations and something that I've seen a lot in my own clinical work as well. And, you know, especially with the prevalence of social media, there has been so much of an increased, uh, it's such an increase in the way people, you know, worry about the way that they look and, you know, trying to meet certain standards of beauty. So, I mean, to even give a certain type of perspective, I think that, you know, it has become so common within this community where there are even certain things like app, apps or filters to edit and modify the way that you look by changing your features to match that of others. And then this also perpetuates the problem because it sets standards of beauty as something that's unattain unattainable. And, you know, I bring this up because this has become the new norm in, in a lot of ways in the community where, you know, it obviously creates a, a certain type of peer pressure to always look better than your best. And so as the scenario depicts, the pressure and the stress to conform to certain standards uh, of beauty causes a complete lack of self-esteem and self-confidence. And honestly, uh, during Ramadan as well, where all of us are trying to focus even more on our deen, the effects of trying to alter your looks through changes in eating habits can even um, have a lot of worse effects than when you're not even fasting. So many very common conditions like anorexia, bulimia, purging can all be worsened within our sacred month as well. And I think it's really important to kind of recognize that. So as the scenario asks, what can be done to help those inflicted with these issues that are made worse Ramadan, made worse in Ramadan? Um, it's obviously not always an easy answer, but I think that something this is something that really does have to take seriously and something that we do have to recognize as a community. 
um, during this time of social isolation, it's critical that those who suffer, you know, have a sub proper support system in place. And, you know, I've mentioned that before, but I think it's very pertinent to kind of reach out to family and friends who, you know, you can really hold close to yourself and bring up some of these topics with them and speak to them, speak to them about negative uh, emotions and feelings and thoughts. And, you know, here I would also like to emphasize that if there is no one in your life that you can really confide these feelings with, I think it's really important to kind of seek out therapy or seek out help for your mental health. Um, and talk to somebody, you know, about these feelings. And especially during, you know, this time, there's a lot of access to online so social groups, teletherapy, and different ways you can kind of reach out without even leaving your home. So I think this is something really important to kind of consider and keep in mind. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sister Iman. I think uh, beautifully uh, said, uh, in, in, in Islam, um, we are um, uh, ordered from God to thank God for what we have and to reflect on the blessings that we have and not really to look at other people and what they have because God Almighty has gave every and each one of us some um, blessings that actually uh, fitting with his uh, or her circumstances and his or her life and uh, we don't really know about others and I always say that I always people when people come uh, to me uh, you know for family counseling or you know, and they really feel like the, 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 their family um, uh, situation or um, uh, problems or difficulties are unique and they are the only one while everybody else is happy. I always smile and I say, you don't know. You know, I, I, I cannot tell you because these are like secrets of my clients, but you don't know. Like people who you may, you may uh, see are smiling and laughing and posting uh, beautiful uh, uh, pictures on Instagram and vacations and in love and other things. You don't know. And I even mentioned it in one of my khutbas uh, about the, 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 the negative effect of social media. Uh, I remember I watched a movie uh, once. I think the, the name of the movie was like a, 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 the girl on the train or something like that. When a girl used to go to work by train every day and every day she, uh, uh, she passed by a uh, house in a countryside and she see like, you know, something that is like snap uh, thing that, that she see every day. Uh, like you know the lady of the house like you know standing the the husband bringing coffee or something like that and she had some some story she made it up in her um, in her mind that this is the the most uh, happy family and i wish if i am with them i wish if i'm this lady while from the other uh, from the other side actually uh, this lady was in a miserable life and she had a lot of difficulties and a lot of problems we need to understand that you know people have their own uh, way of, of, of living and they have their own gifts and we are so we are gifted we you know we should accept the way we look we should accept the the the, the life we have we should thank god for, for it at the same time also we should try our best to follow and moderate the uh, um, uh, our, our habits especially in the months of ramadan god almighty said in the quran eat and drink but waste not by excess for allah does not uh, does not love the, the waster and for, for prophet muhammad peace be upon him while he was a leader and he had access to food and drinks and other things. And one of the misconceptions about Prophet Muhammad that he was poor at all time. Of course not. You know, he had a lot of money in many times and he distributed all and he shared it all. And he had this moderation, especially with food. And he said that, that you know, in one of the common hadith that, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, then he should uh, may fill, uh, fill his stomach with a third of his food and a third of his drink and a third of his uh, breath. You know, just to, 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 to say that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, said that um, uh, We do not eat until we feel hungry And then when we eat, we do not really fill our stomach with all kinds of food Even if we have food And again, with COVID-19 situation, thank God that we have Ramadan now But before Ramadan, like we just like, you know, for myself I just go to the kitchen and open the fridge just for fun Just, just to say hi And if there is something uh, <laughs> good, good to eat, I would grab it and eat it So we have to watch this, we have to uh, uh, protect and, and, and thank God uh, for the blessing that we have, which is the gift of uh, body and the gift of health. At the same time, we should accept uh, what we have from God Almighty. Right, like practicing gratefulness and that and that sort of thing could definitely help in a situation like this. But I do want to ask you, let's just say in this scenario, somebody has, by, by a professional, has been diagnosed with something like anorexia or bulimia or some sort of eating disorder. What do they do in a Ramadan where it's, it actually is almost impossible for them, to, for them to fast and it's actually quite dangerous what does islam uh say about that because it can be considered as a disease or a disorder or an illness of some sort so i would i would love your yeah of course insight. i mean the, the general rule here that if there is any uh, kind of disease or sickness or disorder that require not to fast uh, or it, it might uh, put the person in 
in uh, health in, in danger or in serious condition when they fast. The, the, the general rule here is to break their fast. They don't have to fast. Um, if there is hope in the future that this uh, will be removed from them and they will be better and they will be able to fast, then they have to wait until they get better so they can fast or make up the days that, uh, of Ramadan later. If there is no hope and this is something like, you know, uh, let's say diabetes or some sort of uh, uh, sickness that will continue with the person, uh, then they need to uh, uh, feed one person for every and each day they, uh, they break the fast in. So if, so if it's 29 days or 30 days, they should uh, feed 30 people or 29 people. And they shouldn't really feel uh, bad for this. Uh, God Almighty said that this is a legal excuse. And again, Islam look at sickness and uh, these things as something that I have no control over. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's part of our test as human beings. And we have to be patient and, uh, uh, and we have to accept it from God. Of course, we have to seek uh, um, uh, uh, any possible way to uh, remove it from us and to uh, uh, make it better uh, uh, to uh, seek medication and cures and other things but at the same time we should be um, uh, we should praise Allah and thank Allah for what we have and we should uh, face it with, with with patience as well right thank you for that so you know we know we have that like Islamic perspective on it and you know for anybody else who's like not convinced that this is something that's very severe as we had stated earlier like every hour in the United States, somebody dies from eating disorder. So I'm very to, high mortality rate. Yeah, I'm um, going to put that on there, um, Bilal. Yeah. And uh, uh, Sheikh, thank you for clarifying the Islamic perspective on that. Actually, anorexia is the number one, is the psychiatric disease with the number one mortality. So it's really no joke, like higher than schizophrenia, higher than bipolar is anorexia, which at least the first time I read it, I was very surprised that that's what it is. Um, and, you know, in addition to the usual things which cause mortality and morbidity in people with psychiatric illness, here you have a lot of electrolyte abnormalities and things like that. Somebody who goes without food and water for these extended periods of time really have to think about if, you know, what sort of fasting is this? What sort of, what sort of worship is this if this is what's going on? Um, and so I'm glad, to, I'm glad that you're adding that perspective. I hope it gets more out there that this is um, an excused absent, for lack of a better word. Um, towards fasting. Right. Uh, and then just really quick, just for some clarification from our mental health professionals, I know one of the uh, kind of roots of this type of problem that we had discussed was um, about ungratefulness or, you know, that standard of beauty. I do want to bring to everybody's attention from a, from a, from a viewer Q&A. So eating disorders, this person said, are also about control to an otherwise chaotic life. So what would you guys say about um, kind of that, that side of it. If you want me to repeat it, I can. Yeah, so I said that uh, eating disorders are also about control to an otherwise chaotic life. Um, it's not always about ungratefulness or beauty. So more yeah, no, I, I'd love to comment on it because I think that's something that's extremely true in that, you know, it's really important to recognize that disordered eating is often a coping mechanism for other stressors and negative emotions in somebody's life. So things like low self-esteem, a negative body image, dysfunctional family, traumas, they're many different things that can cause a person to result in some of these behaviors. So when really looking at treating these behaviors, it's important to recognize that, you know, we're not, we're not trying to help a person, you know, start eating more or eating less. You know, it's really, we have to delve into the real issue at hand is what's causing these people to engage in these type of type of behaviors. So I think it's important to recognize that when, you know, thinking about an eating disorder, that there's more to it. It's not simply just, you know, telling somebody to eat more, eat less, and, you know, forcing or forcing somebody to do that. You know, you have to kind of look within and look a little deeper. So I, I would really agree. Right. Um, so just really quick to all the viewers as well, the panelists, we're probably going to go to like 7.10 or 7.15 instead of the original 7 o'clock, just so we have more time to answer all these questions um, that are coming in from the viewers. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Iman. And then I want to switch back to um, Sheikh Hassan really quick. Somebody asked, so are there confidential resources um, to help with these sort of addictions at Mesfits um, and, uh, and other Islamic organizations? Yes, of course. Um, uh, we offer uh, help um, uh, in, in, in the Masajid and the Islamic centers and most of the Masajid and Islamic centers that I know. Uh, we offer professional help. We actually have a connection with uh, professional uh, um, uh, physicians and uh, uh, you know uh, professional uh, 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 counselors uh, when we uh, refer to them some of the cases of course I mean sometimes the cases 
are very uh, simple and people just come and they know what to do, but they just need some spiritual guide um, or reminder. Uh, but sometimes it's more complicated and, uh, you know, it's obviously beyond our uh, time and, uh, and ability. And uh, that's why we work actually with three different uh, sisters who are professionals, uh, professional counselors. So we refer to them and we uh, communicate with them and we work with them in doing that. And this is all confidential. Uh, we don't really, uh, of course, we have to be confidential in these things uh, at all time. And uh, we really ask people to walk to the masajid if they feel that they need to. And uh, we always say that the masajid should be a judgment-free zone. Uh, we, we cannot judge each other. We are not judges. You know, we are, we are reformers. We are uh, brothers. We are sisters. Uh, we cannot judge each other. Uh, the only judge is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty. So please come, even if you... Uh, if you feel like you, you don't deserve to come, actually, uh, once you feel that you don't deserve to come, please come and come to the mosque and talk to, uh, to the imam or talk to the youth director or uh, talk to a sister or a brother. Uh, seek uh, help from them. Uh, if, of course, only if you trust them and you know that they can uh, help you confidentially. And talk to God and just like have your own conversation with him. And don't allow anyone to judge you or to prevent you from seeking help by yourself because no one, no one ever, can uh, uh, judge who should uh, ask God and who should not ask God. Actually, if, if only uh, righteous people should go to the masajid, so how about the, the sinners? Where, where should they go? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is opening his, uh, his doors of acceptance and repentance. And uh, every day, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Prophet Muhammad said, he opens the, uh, the gates of repentance at night for those who sin in the daytime. And he opens the gates of repentance and maghfirah and forgiveness in the daytime for those who sin at night until the day of judgment. So we should really like, you know, seek help. We should seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala support. Even if I have, if I have some, uh, some problems, I, I, I need just to go to him directly and talk to him. If I feel like I need to talk to someone to help me, of course, as brothers and sisters, and, and please for all of our brothers and sisters who go to the message, please do not judge anyone. We all have our own problems and God knows, you know, if Allah to uh, uh, reveal like, you know, what we have and uh, uncover what we have, nobody will even come close to us. So please don't judge anyone. Please work with anyone. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. once he was addressed by one of the young people, one of the youth who came in front of everyone. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, please give me permission to commit adultery. I'm a young man and I feel like I want to do it. And in front of everyone, and, and, and everyone was like, you know, shocked by this person, young man coming to the prophet and asking him to give him permission to commit adultery. But Rasulullah, he smiled and he asked him to sit. And then in a very nice, beautiful, wise conversation, he asked him, do you, do you accept it for your mother? He said, no. Do you accept it for your wife? He said, no. Do you accept it for your sister? He said, no. And if you don't accept it for them, also people do not accept it for their people. So how about getting married? And so we have to accept each other and we have to avoid judging each other. Right. Yeah, it's important to stay away from that type of uh, judgment mentality whenever somebody's going through something like this. And like you said, you know, messages do have um, resources available to help people deal with, this, deal with these sort of things. Um, but if anybody else wants to comment, uh, please do so. Um, yes, there's a live question that I just want to communicate. Um, it, it really just deals with the other side of self-esteem, which is self-worth. Um, because you know your value does not diminish regardless of someone's perception about you you know a diamond can be in the mud but it's still a diamond you know and i think that you know uh, there's a person who's saying that they recovered from being uh from anorexia but they worried about what people say about eating and you know you're not supposed to eat too much and they're trying to balance um you know their recovery and their dean we're not saying that you shouldn't eat I don't think Islam or anyone is saying that you shouldn't eat. There's a difference between being gluttonous and, you know, starving yourself and you have to seek balance. So I think that when you see the value of yourself and what you've done to recover, that's a blessing. And when you finish fasting, then you should eat. You should not be gluttonous, but you should eat. You should as, as, as Brother Sheikh said, take your time, you know, chew your food, as they say, masticate your food, chew it slowly, you know, but you should not feel like you have to overdo it. Just seek the middle ground and be balanced. So I just wanted to communicate that based upon one of the 
anonymous attendee questions because it's a lot of stress as being, you know, that's being projected. And I understand that you're trying to seek a balance and, and in seeking a balance, you're not wrong. Go ahead and eat. You, you don't have to feel like Islam is trying to starve you. It, that, that's, that's not what this is. Absolutely. I think balance is super important. Um, before we move on to the next scenario, we have a couple of um, questions in the anonymous Q&A. And if we do, we do not have enough time to get to them, what we'll do is, inshallah, um, some of our professionals who are you know, on this webinar or uh, watching from behind the scenes, inshallah, you can drop your email in the chat box. Um, the professionals can. And these people who are asking these questions, feel free to email these professionals as well. And inshallah, your question will be answered if we don't get to it during this webinar. So Iman, if you want to do that, Dr. Shwab, if you're willing to do that. And then we also have Dr. Jasmine, Dr. Fahad, and a couple other um, psychologists um, and mental health professionals who are willing to do that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move actually from scenario three to our scenario on pornography. I feel like it's a pretty loaded topic, and I definitely want to hear um, everybody's perspective, but especially Dr. Shoaib, as well as the Islamic perspective from uh, Sheikh Hassan Salt. Once again, I'm going to go ahead and read it out loud. My marriage has been up and down. My significant other caught me watching porn twice and it has put a strain on our relationship. My spouse feels not good enough and says they lost respect for me. I have been watching pornography since my early teens, sometimes multiple times a day. I want to stop, but it seems impossible. Sometimes I feel like a dirty person and a slave to the things I watch. I promised myself I would change in Ramadan, but it hasn't happened. I cannot even properly fast because of my addiction. I'm scared to get help. What do I do? So again, pretty uh, kind of similar to the other ones where this person is, uh, you know, they feel as if they may be a lost cause and they're scared to get out help. They don't know what to do and they're doing this thing multiple times a day and it's become kind of a part of them, uh, to them. So anybody who wants to go ahead and um, answer this one, please do. I'll say a couple of things. Um, you know, I think one issue here is that this is something that isn't as universally recognized as uh, uh, an official disease of some sort. And I'm not saying it should or shouldn't be, but I'm saying that the fact that that's the case makes it very hard for them to see it as a problem that they could get some help for officially. Um, so there's a lot of uh, you know, opportunities here where this person gets some help. Um, one point here is that they're having issues with their uh, relationship or their marriage around this. And um, uh, some, some, some of this is getting shared in terms of not being good enough. Um, so uh, some sort of treatment together in a couple's situation would be useful for them. So these both of these people could understand what, you, what each person's issue is. If somebody feels not good enough because somebody else is doing something, why is that happening? Why are they feeling not good enough if the other person is supposedly doing something wrong? And again, and also I think there's also room to try to approach this as something other than, oh, I'm doing something wrong and I'm bad. Because if you sign on to that, I think you're not doing this person a service. And I think that's where they could be some conflicts in terms of approach. Um, so, you know, this person is really self -cond uh, condemning themselves and really not, that doesn't help. That's neither fun or, or nor is it effective in terms of getting, getting better, getting past this. So I think uh, first, I think there has to be some uh, normalizing of what this behavior is in terms of what, you know, looking at porn starting teenage years, things like that. A lot of people uh, do this. Where does it become a problem for this person? This is becoming a problem because it's affecting their relationship and uh, they feel like a slave to it. They feel shame, they feel dirty. So that's where it's really becoming a problem, not in the absolute. So uh, again, I would try to help this person understand that this is not a unique problem. A lot of people have it. Um, the problem is really the reaction to it or the shame or whatever they're trying to resolve by relying on this. Um, so, and again, you know, this starts off with saying my marriage has been up and down. Um, so, so that's, that's where I would say it, to, to let them know that help is available and uh, while they're scared, uh, there, there's people who have gotten help around this. I think I would just kind of like to reiterate a lot of what Dr. Shoy was saying in that, you know, first and foremost, I think this is really great that we're kind of bringing this topic to light and speaking on it, because, you know, this is a very difficult subject to talk about and it is very taboo, but the only way that we're going to kind of work on things like this is to start conversing about it and, you know, start talking about these issues. So it's really great that this was included as one of the scenarios. Um, I think that, you know, as Dr. Shoy was also mentioning, you know, this, 
this, this scenario kind of scenario kind of does highlight a few potential causes of anxiety and stress as it states that the person's marriage is up and down, you know, feelings of the spouse that he or she doesn't feel good enough and there's a loss of respect. And, you know, this is something again that needs to be discussed. And I think that some points to consider include that this is very serious because, you know, one, it could get worse over time as time persists and if this continues, it can get worse. But then also it, it can has the potential of eventually becoming not enough because we get desensitized and eventually look to find these things or, you know, elsewhere in real life, which can then, you know, impede a lot of our, you know, mental and physical health as well. So I think that you know, a large cause of maybe scenarios like this can be issues of communication, um, you know, between two spouses or, you know, the stress that is filled between two spouses. And, you know, furthermore, also just, I would look, like to kind of focus on a connection to religion as well. You know, in regards to religion and, you know, with being in Ramadan, I feel as though we have a huge opportunity right now to re-engage re re and reconnect with our family and our theme. So I think what's important to recognize here is that, you know, this is something that somebody needs help with but it's important to kind of connect with other aspects of religion as well to kind of get that sense of confidence and that sense of you know um your relatability and just kind of be able to you know focus on religion to kind of help us get through some of these things so i think first and foremost it's very important for a you know a qualified muslim therapist can really help in a scenario like this but then also we can really use ramadan to kind of focus on these other aspects of our religion and bring ourselves up in different ways so that we can better help ourselves combat something like this and yes yeah, so i believe that's, that's very important i would um i would say in agreement with, with what's been said before when you look at you know, the feelings of, of being scared and feeling like a dirty person and, you know, the feelings that's being expressed here. Um, I feel like a slave, you know, to the things I watch and I'm scared and I want to know what to do. However, this didn't start when I, um, I, I was, uh, I became married. I've been watching this, you know, he said, I'm watching, I've been watching this since my early teens. So you have years of, you know, pleasure seeking uh, through this way. And now it's a big problem because you have affected your spouse in a very negative way. So you're looking at layers here of, uh, of shame, of guilt, of hurt. Um, you're looking at layers of you know, questions that need to kind of go into, well, are you willing to now seek some other ways of pleasure? Because I can't do Ramadan because I know what I'm doing is salacious. I know that Allah created sex, so that's not nasty. That's not dirty. However, the salacious aspect of pornography, that's where the problem comes in at when you start dealing with the salacious aspect of it. So this kind of scenario, um, you know, it makes me really look at some of the other situations and cases that um, I've experienced over the years. And for that person just to know that, look, you have a right to feel the way you feel. However, again, if you say that you want help and that you really want to get out of this feeling, then okay, let's look at what you can do to redefine what it is that you're getting pleasure from. Because if you love your wife, if you care about your wife, you're gonna to have to do some redefining. And as we peel the layers back and help the person to peel those layers back to look at how he can redefine himself because you're not a dirty person from the perspective of, you know, you're bad, you're rotten, you're no good. No, you have a particular issue. You have a particular issue that needs to be dealt with because this goes back to your teenage years. and you know, teenage years is full of challenges when it comes to hormones and, and how do you decipher what's right, the right thing to do versus what's the wrong thing to do and how you would appear in front of people. So, you know, I just wanted to add that to uh, what we've said thus far regarding this scenario. All right, thank you for that. Um, before we wrap up, I do wanna make sure we at least acknowledge some of the questions uh, that are coming in. Um, I, and one of them kind of has to do with what we talked about earlier, one of where it's talking about or somebody has addiction or something and someone just says, you know, like, uh, read this ayah, you know, pray this salat or whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? I think we had covered that earlier in talking about like Islam does not 
does not just pre prescribe, you know, that sort of thing. You can get help in many other ways and take a more like, uh, you know, holistic approach to it. Uh, and then another question that I think we could, we could, we could turn to Dr. Soeb as well as Iman, how can I help a family member uh, realize they have an eating disorder and I want, you know, this person wants them to get help, what can they do? I think in a situation like this, of course, it is very difficult to, you know, speak to a family member, sometimes, sometimes people who don't necessarily, you know, realize that they have an issue or want to get help. So I can definitely recognize that this is, this is something that's difficult. And a lot of people I feel within our community face something, face this as well. I think something that could potentially be something to try is, you know, speak to them try to engage with them in other ways in, in regards to kind of, you know, ease them into certain topics, you know, have them come with you or attend different lectures or discussions or you know, take advantage of kind of resources that are available to kind of let this person, you know, learn and kind of figure out more about eating disorders. Because I think the first step a lot of the time is just to learn what it is and learn, you know, its implications in a person or, you know, how it can really affect a person. So I think, you know, first and foremost, though, though it may be something that's difficult and it's obviously a case by case type of thing, but I think what can be really helpful is to try to get that family member to maybe, you know, start learning about some of these topics, whether it be through you or maybe through a professional or through somebody else who can kind of, you know, best relate to this person or talk to them. So I think that would probably be the first step in my opinion. Um, so uh, around that topic, I think it's a very difficult experience to be with somebody and then they're doing something which you feel is destroying them and for them to not even realize it. So um, starting off on that is, is it must be very difficult uh, to do that. So I think where people get into trouble is when they try to fix the family member or they try to condemn the family member for their behavior and that's usually not helpful. So what is, you know, and I think it's a really challenging question. I think it's important, in my opinion, I think one thing that can be really helpful is to model behavior for recovery because if this person with the addiction or with the problem is seen as the identified problem or they're their problem and you're okay and they need to get fixed, that sort of dynamic is not helpful usually. So what you must have something to work on as well. So if you can start by some sort of program for yourself or engaging in some sort of help for yourself, and then try to detach from their difficulty and remember that their difficulty is their difficulty and you've decided to be with them. So how am I gonna deal with being with a person with this difficulty and how I feel about it? So that you have a problem too. You can't just be one person who has a problem. If you know there's a unit and somebody has a big, somebody has a problem, labeling them as the unique person with the problem is probably not gonna get very far if you wanna help the unit. So to help the unit, what, how are you gonna do your part? To help the couple, to help the family, how are you gonna do your part? So one thing you could do, there are programs for family members like Al-Anon, programs for family members of people who have alcoholism. So I think engaging in one of those programs it serves as, you know, you're putting your money where your mouth is, that I'm going to go and get help. I'm going to go and recover from what I experienced to be a difficulty, which is being a partner to somebody who has this difficulty. And then you'll learn how other people manage with that as well. So I think that sort of modeling behavior could have some at least benefit for yourself. And then you could worry about the benefit it could have to somebody else. Right. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, can everybody hear me? I know I'm lagging a little bit. I see. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, unfortunately, we do have to wrap up, but I really quickly want to say thank you so much to everybody who was able to view this. And thank you so much to all of our panelists, uh, Iman, Dr. Choi, Brother Enoch, as well as Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Hassan. Um, a lot of great perspectives given. It kind of shed some light on what Islam says about these topics and as well as what we can do to get help um, about uh, on these specific um, addictions and uh, issues. Um, so I really want to remind everybody that inshallah, our next webinar will be after Ramadan. So if you want more information about that, visit projectdakwa.org for more information. And if you want to register for the support groups, um, same website, projectdakwa.org slash register. So please do that. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's been my pleasure to moderate and assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.